might actually be the world to somebody, might be their eternal salvation. You know, I think we get lost as a people in this ocean of evangelism and that we're afraid to take simple action, telling people about Christ in our faith. <laughs> to be completely honest, I know that I get scared. You heard that right. I'm standing in front of you preaching this morning, but I get scared talking to people about my faith. But in Christ, I have become incredibly stronger and stronger each and every time that I tell my story. Because I know that I am not alone. But church, we need to get better at this. There's a world of people out there, some across the world, some are across the street from us, that have no idea who Jesus Christ is and why he's important in our lives. In fact, Christ calls upon us to go out and reach the ends of the earth, doesn't he? One thing I hope to focus on today is the simple fact that we allow ourselves to get in our own way when truly the act or art of evangelism is something we are not alone in conducting. But we have the power of Christ to help us. So as we prepare to dive this morning into God's word, I would like all of you to take the following question to consider around your tables. If you thought you were getting away without talking to one another this morning, you are mistaken. So, the question for this morning is, when you hear the term, the Great Commission, what comes to mind? So go ahead, take a few moments, turn to the person on the left of you, right of you, in front of you, get up, cross the room, and let's talk about what this Great Commission is. So go ahead, I'll give you a couple minutes to talk, and we'll come back, and we'll get started. So great to see everyone this morning. All right, so Great Commission, what did you guys come up with? What does this Great Commission bring to mind? Don't everyone jump up at once. Great Commission. Spreading God's word, Spreading God's word absolutely. What else? Making sure that people know about Jesus, absolutely. These are definitely things we're going to talk about this morning. How about one more? Going to all the world, I heard a lot of things, but I definitely heard going to all the world. And that's exactly one of the things that we're going to talk about this morning. So all of these are great examples of what is contained within the Great Commission. And that is exactly where we're going to focus today. We're going to camp out a little bit for, as we continue our series, Who We Are. So we will focus on this topic, and we will dive all the way into God's Word to discuss the importance of the Great Commission and how it shaped our vision here at First Alliance. Last week, if you were with us, Pastor Sean took a moment and he discussed the first section of our vision, which was know. In that mission, we talked about knowing Christ and our focus here at First Alliance on wanting people to come to know our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, and the ways that we hope to engage believers here and non-believers alike in this ongoing process of knowing and loving the one who gave of himself on a cross that we might have eternal life and security in him. So today, 
we're going to jump into the last part of our vision, as Sean kind of pointed out earlier. I'm kind of different like that, so we're going from the beginning to the end because go is so important. And that's exactly what it is for today. Go. So as some of you noted during our question, what is the Great Commission and what it probably brings to mind, is exactly what came out, the fact that Christ commands us to go. And this is a valid assumption. However, today we're going to actually take a look at the text of Matthew 28, 16 through 20, so you can start turning there if you like, and dig a little deeper in order to see what we believe Christ has laid before us as a church. So the Great Commission gives us the direction directly from Christ to go. It also gives us a look at what the process will look like, but a lot of the details of the how are ultimately left to us. So let's not get lost in the details, at least not yet, but let's focus on what Christ actually has called us to do. So let's open our Bibles to Matthew 28, verse 16, and take a look at the text as we begin this morning. So a lot of folks here are probably familiar with this. You've probably seen it before, but the Great Commission is written by Matthew. Chapter 28, verses 16, starting says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age." For this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for the ability to come together as your church and to be able to receive your word as the body of Christ. Father, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to your great word and touch us this morning as we examine your great commission where you called us into service for the kingdom. We thank you for this great opportunity you have entrusted us with to bring forth your saving grace to those who do not yet know you. And we are humbled in the reality that you would use us in this way. Humble our hearts this morning, Lord, as we explore your calling upon us in this church. Father, we pray that all we are and all we will be for the kingdom and for your glory. It is in your glorious Son's name we pray. Amen. So needlessly put, There's a great deal of theological depth in this section of Scripture. However, for this morning and our focus for today, I want everyone to be able to take away what I believe are five key points from the text that I believe sets up for what Christ has called upon us to do as a church and as a people. So is everybody ready? All right, that's what I'm talking about. I got some response out of everybody. But yeah, we need to be ready for this because this is the core. So let's take a look. So here in verse 18, Jesus sets the stage for what he is about to tell the disciples, and he makes the very first key point for this morning, and I want you to capture this because it's really important as we get started. And the first point is this, that all of the authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Christ just laid it all out in front of the disciples and started and stated simply that within himself, the Christ, contained all the authority of one true God. He is the Lord over all dominion. Not sure about the rest of you, but probably right about at this point in the conversation, I was starting to lean in a little bit, starting to pay a little closer attention. Because you need to remember the context of what happened here. As Pastor Sean talked about last week, and if you're familiar, turn back to Matthew 27. This is the first time that the disciples have seen Jesus after he was crucified on the cross. They had witnessed the brutal actions of the Romans being taken out on our Lord. He then conquered the grave, sent a message to the disciples, and appeared before them. So that's point number one. And don't miss this. Christ establishes his authority over all. He just had been crucified. Some of the disciples even stood before them and was kind of confused, didn't even know what they were looking at. So the first thing he tells them is that he is, in fact, God. How amazing. 
So this might seem a bit simplistic to us for those who are already Christians. However, it's also very important for us to remember the context, just as I've been stating. Matthew had covered the death and the brutal realization of this. But the good news stood before them, alive, for our God is alive. In this context, the disciples are still in a state of shock. I mean, wouldn't you be? But just as verses 16 and 17 stated, they still doubt it. Wouldn't you have been a bit skeptical? At this point, resurrection had been something that people had witnessed. Christ had raised others from the dead. But Christ stood before them, self-risen as the one true God. Glory be to God. So in order to remove whatever doubt remained in front of the disciples, Christ affirmed his authority above all else. And then continuing on in verse 19, clearly, clearly, you're leaning in and you're paying attention. For he who could overcome death is clearly the Lord. So verse 19 goes on. And therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So right here in verse 19, after he declares his authority, God continues and gives us the commission, the command. Right here is the meat, the essence of what his instructions are to his disciples. There's three main things here. What do you think you see? What do you think you see in this section? There's primarily three. Anyone? We're going interactive today. Go, make disciples, and baptize them. Right. But let me take a moment and point something out here. Because if we follow the text, which we're very used to doing in English, we go left to right, um, many of us have probably stared at this passage a million times and assumed that the primary verb or action in this sentence is to go, right? Right? How many have heard that over and over again? Yeah, we're supposed to go. That's what we're talking about today. Well, actually, it's really quite interesting what's taking place here. Because if you pull apart the Greek form, because the Greeks are a little weird, they don't put their verbs in order. And what's really interesting is go is actually a passive verb in this sentence, which means it is not the primary verb action of this sentence. I know I just went a little English grammatical 101 right there for a minute, but it's really important that we understand this because what Christ is actually pulling out of the sentence is the primary active verbs in the sentence are actually make disciples and baptize them. What Christ was actually pointing out to the disciples is he already made the assumption that they understood that they were to go. And that's why in the Greek form we see that this is a passive verb because Christ was instructing us to make disciples and baptize in the context of what he was already saying, in other words, was he already knew that the disciples understood that they were on mission, that they had something they were supposed to do. But what he wanted them to understand more than anything else is the what. So this brings us to our second key point. It means that Christ calls us to make disciples. So, this seems pretty straightforward. Christ is Lord. He is now called upon us to make disciples. Simple. Not only at this point am I paying really close attention because the risen Lord is in front of me, I'm probably taking out a little piece of paper and I'm starting to take notes. Because he went from saying, I am God, I have resurrected self, atoned for your sins. He's now giving you a list of things he wants done. And after all that we witnessed in Matthew 27, he says, we are to make disciples. And this is an important instruction. And it begs a few further questions, does it not? Thomas was probably sitting somewhere towards the back starting to raise his hand. What's a disciple? It's a good question. But simply... Is it just simply someone who knows Christ and has prayed the sinner's prayer, given their life over to Christ, or is there more to it? Well, verse 20, which comes next, actually is going to help us a little bit with this. 
But we'll get to that in just a moment. But before that, we want to get to point number three for this morning. And point number three is this. That Christ called us to baptize new believers. Again, pretty straightforward. Once you begin the process of discipleship and growing the new believer in Christ, that they may take to the field and to disciple others, Christ calls on us to baptize them. Just as Christ himself was baptized by John, we are all baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But why is that? Does this mean Christ is saying that this is a requirement for salvation? No. No, Christ is calling upon us to make a public profession of our faith in him, and that this is what a Christ believer does. So let's go back again to the context of what this is, where this conversation is taking pr- place. Christ has been crucified. He's been resurrected. The symbolic event of baptism was given to us by Christ to mark ourselves publicly for him and proclaim his truth. This event allows us publicly to announce our discipleship and our new life in him. So key points number two and three here are the foundation of our actions in the heart of the Great Commission, making disciples and baptizing them. But as I just mentioned, verse 20 now helps us understand this construct. It gets to our next point. So verse 20 goes on, continuing from verse 19, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All right, so in the context of inst- his instructions here, we see that Christ follow up discipleship and baptism with the action of teaching these new disciples. Teaching them what? To obey, right. This expands the definition of simply converting someone into knowing and trusting in Christ to truly teaching them about who Christ is and what the expectations of a believer truly are. Therefore, discipleship isn't simply leading someone to the Savior, but is the ongoing process that is conducted through the initial evangelism through on to helping that new believer grow in Christ. And church, let me tell you something. This is something that as a church in America today, we are not very good at. If you look at churches across this country, we are great at opening our door, professing Christ, getting them to the baptismal pool, but then we drop them right where they sit. We take brand new believers and we leave them baptized and nowhere to grow and be discipled. I think Christ had something very specific to say about that. And we're called upon to ensure that discipleship is never just an end point, but it is an ongoing process. So Christ knew that this walk was going to be hard, but his tension was clearly that this process of bringing people into the kingdom involved more than just that process of dunking them in the tank, yay Jesus, and going to lunch. But in terms of how we help believers grow and walk in Christ, Pastor Sean's going to dive into this topic, as he mentioned, and spend his entire message next week on how we're going to focus on that process of making sure that it's not a one-time event, that as Christians, we walk side by side all the way through. So stay tuned for next week. This is your teaser. You can put the point right there. But for today, we're now going to focus on the last two points of this passage, and they're simply this. Number four, Christ wants us to teach his commands. So as we've discussed, discipling is the process of educating someone to who Christ is and what being a Christian is truly about. Well, in order to know what to teach people, we need to know what Christ expects of us, don't we? In this context, Christ is reminding the group that he has spent his entire ministry in front of them speaking of the kingdom of heaven and the expectations of the Father. In all these things, we are called to help others learn and ultimately obey. As stated, this is not a simple task. In fact, it's probably pretty hard. As no other human being up to this point or after had ever kept all of God's commands perfectly, except for one, and that's Jesus. So now we are faced with the task that seems even more monumental than simply telling somebody about Christ. We hold the responsibility of continuing the education with one another, of continuing to disciple. So if you thought just telling people your faith was hard, 
Now we're on the hook for teaching the expectations to all others where there was only one perfect model. But folks, point number five is probably the most important part of this because we are not alone in this journey. And if you don't believe me, look right here where Jesus finished the Great Commission with the most important part of today's sermon. If you get nothing else, know that point number five is what I want you to walk away with that he will always be with us. After he has established his authority, provided instructions on making disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them the ways of the kingdom, he provides the disciples, and quite honestly, us, with a point of reassurance in this monumental task. I will always be with you. Until when? The end of the age. From the moment he stepped foot on our earth to the moment he went away, he promises that he is the Lord over all and with each and every single one of us until he returns. That all of us in Christ are now never alone, for he is always with us. So as I've mentioned previously, after getting over the shock of the events themselves taking place, I'm now leaning forward in my seat. I've taken 30 pages of notes and I'm probably about to fall off from my chair. And honestly, I'm probably getting a little scared at the reality and the weight of what I've just been told. He was asking them to risk everything, to bring the story of Christ to everyone in the world. But in his last instruction, the very last thing that he told them, I will be there no matter what till the end of the age. So Christ gave them this commission. And it is the same commission that we today take on as a church. And I think I've bowled it down for you for something you can keep in your back pocket and just understand into five very simple points. So let's do a quick review. What was number one? Christ established his authority. That's right. He was the resurrected Lord of all. Number two. Right, we're called to go forth and make disciples. As I stated, it was already assumed that we knew that we were supposed to go, but now we know what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make disciples. Not just believers, but disciples. People who follow, learn, and seek to make more disciples for the kingdom. Number three, we're supposed to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so that they can be publicly identified as followers of God. And number four, He wants us to teach his commands and help others walk the Christian life just as we do. And number five, the most important for today. He will always be with us. So look at this quickly with me, church, because this is important. God never sets us on a path alone. And here, we have a bit of a sandwich, wouldn't you say? At the very beginning and the very end, Christ proclaims himself because he is within us. And we never do anything alone or without him. And that should give us comfort because he reminds us right there in the middle where the things are hard, making disciples, baptizing them, and then helping them in their walk, He's always going to be there. So no matter how hard things get, no matter how dark the world may seem, he will be with us each and every step of the way. You need to remember this. For it's truly amazing, is it not, that the Lord we serve not only gave of himself that we may live in eternity, but that in every step we take for the kingdom, he is going to be there. So let us not lose sight of the path. God is going to be there as we struggle through our personal challenges and sharing with him. He has only asked us to go and make disciples for the nations for him. He will do all of the heavy lifting. It's not us. 
No matter how good you think you're at evangelism or how scared you are to talk to other people, you need to remember it's not about us. Nothing we do as human beings will save people to eternity. Only one man, one God can truly save, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are nothing more than simply the messengers, and we are the messengers that have been called by the one true God. And every step we take on that journey, he is with us. So as I said, I get scared in talking to people every day, but I'm not alone. It is not just me. It is God. It is Christ that empowers me in everything that I do. He empowers each and every one of you as well. For we have nothing to fear for everything we do, we do in him. So let's transition, church. We know what God expects of us, and we know that he is there every step of the way. So we know that his call upon us in our church is to bring that good news to all the nations. But how are we to approach the Great Commission here at First Alliance Church here in Raleigh? Well, Christ clearly outlined a few major objectives, didn't he? Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them my commands. Simple. Okay, maybe not that simple. But as the video showed when we opened up, um, the concept kind of is easy. It's just there's lots of different ways to get there. We need to go to the people who do not know Christ and walk them into knowing, living, and loving. So just as Pastor Sean started to outline last week, we have three terms here at First Alliance that we believe identify us with the body of Christ and the church that he has called us to be. So for this week, it's go. Say that. Right. So what does that mean for First Alliance Church? Well, simply it means this. That we believe that each of us have a responsibility to share the grace of God with everyone. This was so important that it is mentioned at the end of each of the Gospels and the beginning of the books of Acts. As followers of Jesus, we are his witnesses to the life change he has done in us. We have a great privilege to share the love of Jesus Christ with our neighbors. In order to meet the goals of sharing God's grace in accordance with Scripture, we believe it comes down to three simple things here. And that's number one, equipping. In making First Alliance Church a church that goes for Christ, we need to ensure that a firm foundation of equipping everyone for the task of evangelism is able to get to everyone here. We want to create that foundation, that rock which is Christ, which is why we started with know and knowing Christ last week. And in this, we hope to grow resources that help do the two things you see there, discipleship and also partnerships. For those that don't know, we actually have quite a few partnerships where we already have folks that are on the field locally and internationally. You can see some of them here on the screen. But the main idea is that we want to continue to provide folks these different outlets, locally and internationally. For God, Christ called us to go. He called us to make disciples. So that means we need to go to where there are people that don't know him. And the reality of that is there are people that don't know him to the left, to the right, in front, and behind. 50 feet to 5,000 miles. So stay tuned because as we continue to grow in our new vision and our pieces here at First Alliance, we're going to provide more and more options so you can see. As you've already witnessed, we always try to bring you what's going on in the field from the families so that you can see what's going on. And that actually leads to our number two point, which is we also want to help in the sending and supporting of these folks. And that's everything from financial giving to encouragement and prayer and just the communications that we already do. So upon that foundation of discipleship and personal growth, it's how we believe as a church we can actually send and support those who go out and deliver for Christ. That's to say we know that not every single person has a calling to go to the ends of the earth, but there are plenty of ways that we can support this church and support the Great Commission in that prayer, in that giving, because all of these pieces are needed to be able to succeed at getting God's word out to the ends of the earth. And honestly, church, you've seen it. Here at First Alliance, we are very blessed to have many on the international field and have an outstanding platform for sending these folks out. We already give financially. We already support them in prayer and encouragement. But we need to continue. 
So as part of this platform, you're going to see more and more global spotlights. So you can see what our folks are doing. So you can understand the impact that we have as a church and what you can have as an individual on all those who have not yet heard the good news. So these are going to continue. You're going to see them more and more because we want you guys to be plugged into how we are going. These items hand in hand with current and future partnerships, some that we showed before, will give us a firm place where we can enable more and more to go out for him. So stay tuned. More is coming. We just wanted to be able to let you guys know this is something we truly believe in. You've heard the stories already, but you're going to see it more and more front and center in everything that we do. And finally, that's number three, which is the actual going. And as I've stated, many of you already know that we have many families and individuals that are already on the field, and we are truly blessed as a church, truly blessed. The number of families we have on the field right now, there are churches that are amazed that this church has enabled so much of God's kingdom to go out. You should be really proud of what you support and the prayer work that we do here, for we are reaching the nations. However, missions and spreading the word of God isn't just about going overseas, as I mentioned. It's also about our neighborhoods right here at home, in Raleigh itself. To this end, we'll be breaking out our efforts into more local and international with a cross-section of options to serve and go. Locally, over the next year, we hope to increase the number of events we host here or participate in out in the Triangle. Events like our current partnership with Riverbend School have had a great success. But it's time we increase our presence here in the neighborhood and reach out more and more. Next, in order to provide a platform for people interested in learning more about the international field, we want to help align those people with partners so that the world becomes more accessible. So for some folks, going internationally is a really scary concept. But there's lots of great options that we have through the families that we already serve with but also through the Christian and Missionary Alliance itself, that if you're ever interested in a short-term mission, the CMA now has an organization called Envision that does quite a bit domestically in major urban centers, but also many cities in Europe, in Asia, and in South America. A lot of these trips are only a week to two weeks. The cost is less than $1,000 typically. The world is accessible, and we should take the opportunity to go. But hear this, people. The Lord provides us plenty of options. As it's not just about finding those short terms or finding the opportunity to come out on a Thursday night and help us with Riverbend. It's also about the reality that each and every one of us is a missionary every single day of our lives, everywhere we go. The church is not confined by the doors at the front of the room. The church is within us, as Christ is within us, which means your witness to the world, you go wherever you go every single day. And we're called to that mission field, for we are surrounded by the lost at school, at work, at the grocery store. How many people do you pass and do not mention eternal salvation every day? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm pretty guilty of this. But if Christ gave us one mission, it was to reach the world. And we've been given a great deal of access as individuals in this country. So remember, whether it's local or international, we are called every step, every breath, every day. It's going to be hard. It's going to be scary. But in Christ, he is with us and he empowers our mission every step. So take that opportunity. Or listen to that little voice where the Holy Spirit's been nagging at you saying, it's time to step out. Take a short-term mission trip. The opportunities are endless. And you're going to hear about an amazing opportunity that some folks of our congregation are taking very soon. There's lots of lost people in this world. There are parts of this world that have never seen a Bible have never heard the name Jesus Christ. And we all are the missionaries. So in total, there are three ways that we believe that we're going to be preparing here 
at First Alliance to equip you all to become part of that movement, to become part of the missions movement. And to accomplish all of these future and ongoing goals, we're actually in the process of creating a committee that is going to focus on all these issues, local and international, and organize these efforts. So in the very near future, you're going to be hearing more about the committee work and all the different ways that we are enabling everyone to go. For Christ called us to be ascending church. We weren't called to sit and to disciple and to throw barbecues and events every now and then. He called us to go. So what stands in the way, church? What better place than here and what better time than now? If we are all the enabled missionaries that Christ has called us to become, why can't it be us? So are you ready? Christ has called upon us to do his work and to not allow anyone to go without the story of him who gave of himself that we all might have eternal salvation. This is our chance, our time, to get out there and let the world know that we serve a God that wishes all to have the same eternal security. But they need to hear the story. They need to understand how to seek that salvation, and they need to know that they will not be alone in their walk. We are all in this together, and it is as a church and as a body that we must lift up our bootstraps and seek the world for him. He has called us to this mission, and the mission is all around us. It's not just in this building, or this neighborhood, or this city, or this state, or this country, or this continent. It is this world. No, this mission is wherever you go. And as a church, we believe that we must be the platform to enable the masses to go out and tell the world of him and his amazing grace. For none of us deserve salvation, but in our faith we obtain the atoning grace of the one true God. We are privileged to tell his story and should want that everyone hears his name. So are you ready, church? Are you ready to be the church, to be the faith, and be Christ everywhere you go? Well, let's go then. Keep your eyes open for all the new opportunities we're going to have here at First Alliance and take every opportunity to step out in your personal life. I told you up front, it scares the living daylights out of me. If I'm scared, I know you're scared, but it's okay. If you want some advice, go see Lewis. That man is amazing, and he's smiling right now, and he's trying to do this. <laughs> the man has a gift of just knowing how to bring personal evangelism. I know he's not the only one. Find those other folks in this congregation, because we are not alone. You have brothers and sisters in Christ all around you. But no, the most important thing we have is Christ. So let's go. And Father, we thank you for your word and for the work that you did upon that cross. For we did not deserve the grace that you gave. But then you rose from the grave and gave us but one instruction to reach the nations. Father, we pray for this mission. We pray for those who already serve as our church goes across the globe. We pray for those who are considering service and pray that you would open the doors to let them serve you where your word is needed most. Father, I pray that you give us all a heart for the lost and pray that you would open our eyes to the lostness of those we are surrounded by each and every day. I pray for this neighborhood, Father. I pray for this city and for this state, for our country, and ultimately the world, that your name would be heard and accepted. Father, enable us, your church, for great things that we would be a church that goes out to the world rather than stays behind our own doors. For you are ascending God, Father, and we are here to serve. And it is in Christ's name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen.